Good morning, everybody. Um, as uh, European societies and European Jewelry in particular are facing unprecedented threats of uh, jihadist uh, terrorism across Europe, from my home country, France, and Paris in particular, and until last weekend in Copenhagen, European states are trying to find new creative solutions to try to prevent and contain maybe this incontainable issue. Uh, some countries, such as France and Britain, are adopting a tough and a strict approach by mixing uh, the introduction of new legal measures uh, to the introduction of large budgets that are allocated to the intelligence services. Other countries, such as Denmark, and you may know that Denmark has the highest percentage of uh, returning jihadists across Europe, are adopting a softer approach, a soft war, as they've, been, uh, as they've introduced rehabilitation centers where returning jihadists you know, are being treated by psychologists, social workers, and people who try to address their issues and integrate them back to uh, the, um, the work market. Uh, this morning, we're pleased and honored to welcome Mr. Pierre Lelouch, a very well-known French politician, lawyer, and political analyst. He's currently a member of the Assemblée Nationale of the French Parliament, but most importantly for us, he's the UMP, the UMP is Nicolas Sarkozy's, the former president, right-wing party. He's the UMP gener uh, um, speaker for uh, foreign affairs. Pierre Lelouch uh, studied law at Harvard University where he received his PhD. He became a lawyer and the co-founder of the French Institute for International Relations, IFRI, somewhat the French equivalent of INSS. As a specialist of foreign affairs, he was the diplomatic advisor to Jacques Chirac, and he was also elected president of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly between 2004 and 2006. Under Nicolas Sarkozy's presidency, he was successively French Special Representative for Afghanistan Pakistan, Minister for Europe, and Foreign Trade Minister. So without further ado, I would like to welcome you now on stage. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> These uh, last few weeks have been a moment for great emotions in France and in Europe. And uh, intellectual and political awakening to what is happening. Uh, on the 7th of January, uh, as an elected member in Paris, uh, and also as a city council member, I found it my duty to be immediately on the spot of the terrorist attack on the newspaper, Charlie Hebdo. I found myself with the justice minister, and we saw, of course, uh, the war scene, the blood and all of this that you know here in Israel. And then uh, a few days later, I, would, I was one of the three and a half million people uh, out in the street of Paris. And then I walked uh, through Paris, all the way back to my constituency in the synagogue, the great synagogue of Paris, called La Victoire, when you had this office for the, for the four Jewish people who had been killed in the kosher store. President of the Republic was there, Benjamin Netanyahu was there. He later addressed the synagogue, but that, by that time I had left, thank God, because I completely disagree. and I come back to that with what he had to say. 
But let me start perhaps by sharing with you a personal experience that took place exactly a week ago, last Tuesday, which left a very deep impression uh, on me, but I think summarizes exactly the problem we are faced with in France and in Europe generally. Uh, last Tuesday morning, I went with a colleague of mine to the prison of Fresnes outside Paris, which is a large prison with uh, uh, at least 1,500 inmates. But uh, it's also a prison where uh, nearly 40 jihadists, French jihadists, coming back from Syria and Iraq are now detained, either because they've been condemned of terrorism or awaiting trial. And the prison is experiencing a system in which they are set aside in a separate wing in order not to contaminate the others. Uh, and so it's a very novel experience. It's interesting that uh, all of these guys, except one, were men, uh, one is female. They're all between uh, the age of 25 and 35. About 15 to 20 percent of them are converted. The rest are uh, children of immigration, born and raised in France. And when you look in their eyes, it's, uh, believe me, it's chilling to measure how much we have failed in turning these young people from North Africa, originally from North Africa, their parents from North Africa or Africa, into, into killing machines. Um, one of the problems we have is that these people will be out. The most dangerous of them is a converted and is going to be out in three years' time and most likely to, to shoot again. That's one of the problems we have to face. The same day, that evening, I had dinner at the Iraqi embassy with uh, President Massoud Barzani, with the regional president of Kurdistan, and Barzani, and I had been in Kurdistan in September uh, with former Prime Minister François Fillon. Uh, Barzani was there to thank France for the weapons that we actually give the Kurds to fight the Islamic State and ask for more. So here we are a situation where in the morning I see French citizens coming back from war in which we have French arms and French pilots, actually, fighting on the side of the Kurd. Last July, uh, President Hollande rightly exhorted the French people not to import on French soil the conflicts of the Middle East. And yet, this is exactly what is happening to us with unprecedented social security political challenges for our nation. We have, as you well know, in France, the largest Jewish community in Europe, and we also have the largest Muslim community. And we also have something which is not quite understood in many countries outside Europe, including in America or in England, and that is our notion of laïcité, of a secular state, separated from religion, and I'll come back to this. So France prides itself on being one of the world's top military powers with a robust nuclear arsenal, highly professional and respected military force. We are now on the forefront of at least three wars at the same time in Mali and across the Sahel with the Barkhane operation. with more than 3,500 soldiers involved, air force and so on, covering the Sahel region we are involved in Central Africa and also watching over uh, uh, what is going on in northern Cameroon and southern Niger uh, uh, with uh, Boko Haram. And we are involved in, in Iraq, in the coalition. And yet, uh, since March 2012, when Mohamed Merah started his killing spree in the Toulouse area, killing a, a 
French soldiers of Muslim extraction and Jewish children since Mehran attack in 2012 and since the Nemush attack in Brussels, the Kouachi brothers and Koulibaly on the early January, we've had 28 dead people on French soil in less than three years, more than the total number of French military casualties in all these operations outside France. So the result is that we now have 10,000 soldiers involved on the outside front and 10,000 French soldiers currently on French soil protecting sensitive facilities, including, of course, newspapers, synagogue, and so on and so forth. So a question I want to address, and I'm going to try to, even though we started late, vaguely stay within the time limit, is how did we get here and what to do about it? The first step, I think, uh, in understanding what's going on here, and for once I will agree with uh, your foreign minister, Lieberman, if you want to look at current terrorism, you have to forget about every terrorist experience that we had in the past. And in Europe, we had a lot of terrorist experience, whether it was a regional terrorism in Ireland, Basque in Spain, or in Corsica, extreme left uh, groups like Bada Minov, uh, Red Brigade, and so on, or imported terrorism. We had PKK, we had Palestinian terrorism, we had Iranian, state Iranian terrorism in France. None of this is comparable to what's going on today because these goals were limited and the objectives at the time were limited. Today we are faced with a completely different challenge. So the second step is to try and take a hard look, a lucid, non-complacent look at what is happening and given my position, try to do it without fear of being politically incorrect. It's not easy but I'm going to try. My bottom line is that Mira, Kouachi, or even the Danish killers are the monstrous children of the collision through internet, which has become the most efficient propaganda machine of the universe. Through internet, they've been the children of the collision of two monumental problems. One is happening outside Europe, and that is the transformation of the Orient. And the other is the internal front, what is happening to Europe as a result of massive long-term settlement immigration. Let me look at the external front first. Here at this institute, you, you know what's going on in your region, um, probably better than me, but as I see it, there are four trends at work at the same time. First of all, the implosion of the Middle East territorial order, as was invented by the French and the British exactly 100 years ago. Remember, the Sykes-Picot line, from the E of Acre to the K of Kirkuk. This is over. Iraq as invented by its British parents, has now ceased to exist and imploded into three pieces. Syria, even worse. And the danger, of course, is looming over Lebanon, over Jordan, and even over some of the Gulf countries. So what we are seeing here is this unprecedented situation where we don't know what will happen to these states next. The second thing that is happening is the uh, contamination of a lot of Islamic, of, of Muslim countries with an ideology imported from the Gulf, namely Wahhabism. Uh, I was born in Tunisia, and I think I know a little bit about North Africa or even West Africa. The brand of Islam which was carried out in this country have nothing to do with what is happening today. Why? Because as a result of this oil money, uh, preachers, mosques were built, which have profoundly changed the kind of Islam that is being practiced in those areas, adding to the destabilization 
and this is the third factor, the so-called Arab Spring, of a number of Arab countries which simply caved in uh, as a result of decades of bad governance, <coughs> failure of nationalist ideas, socialist ideas, which was a post-colonial uh, backbone of newly independent states. In this void, Wahhabism has come to replace uh, um, uh, organized states. Finally, what is also happening, and this is a fourth trend, is the re-emergence of the Shiite Sunnite conflict, which uh, tend to, for the moment, produce a situation in which the Arab side is weakened and non Arab countries are now winning. And the two non Arab winners are called Turkey and Iran, while the Arab countries are weakened. So all of that is happening on the outside front. And the result of this, of course, colored by a variety of ethnic, local, uh, or political uh, um, factors, the, look, the result of this is the appearance on the southern rim of Europe of a whole series of black holes. Black holes, or you can call them state of jungle, or birth of new caliphates. And if you look at it from my country, it's quite impressive. Mali, northern Mali. Uh, Libya, Central African Republic, Boko Haram, which is affecting four countries, Nigeria, Niger, Chad, and Cameroon. Uh, moving east, uh, you have the Shebeb, the Shebab, then Yemen, then Sinai, then Syria, then Iraq. Not to speak of uh, the old Afpak question and Vazirista. So you have a whole series of uh, 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 of empty spots in which caliphates, Islamic jihadist, extreme Salafist uh, groups are running, often mixed with drug trafficking, common crime. So the, the point being, the common point being extreme violence, extreme violence, Boko Haram is just as bad as uh, Daesh. Use of uh, modern communication means um, and very ambitious goals of holding land and governing people over, over large, large pieces of territory. Now that is the picture which is confronting Europe today. Uh, as to the internal front, uh, what we are uh, seeing is a result of uh, 40 years of benign neglect on a central subject, which is immigration. We've carried out a complacent policy, very often non-controlled, very different from the immigration policy you have in America or in Canada or in Australia. We didn't want to know, and we continue to be in a sort of denial attitude vis-a-vis -a, -vis a situation where in France, believe it or not, it's even forbidden to count. We don't know how many people are of what face, coming from what area, or, uh, or born or not born. It's impossible to know because it's forbidden by law. Uh, recently, I bought at Brookings a very interesting book which uh, analyzes the political consequences of immigration, ethnic group by ethnic group. Such book is impossible in France. So we're left in fantasy. So the numbers I'm giving you now are the numbers of the Central Institute Islam Archive Deutschland, or the Pew Research Center, or the John Templeton Foundation, but I have no French numbers. Globally, uh, there are about, they say, about 16 million Muslims in Europe. France being the largest contingent with about 8% of the population. They say about 5.5 million, maybe 6 million, going up to 7 million in 2030. I personally believe, and I've studied this question for many years, that these numbers are vastly underestimated. Uh, current, this year alone, France is uh, uh, letting in 200,000 legal entries 
of which 100,000 are fa uh, family regrouping, 50,000 stu students, the rest being, being, being uh, humanitarian, in addition to which 70,000 asylum seekers, 80% of which will be re rejected, but everybody stays because we don't carry any expulsion, plus at least 70,000 illegal uh, migrants. So you're talking about 350,000 people. Most of these people come from North Africa and West Africa. Large majority of them, large majority of them, are of the Muslim faith, and therefore they are bound to import with them the tension, the contradiction of today's Islam. It's a fact. It's not an accusation. I'm certainly not saying that all Islamists, all Muslims are Islamists or jihadists, but the fact is that there is a trend of violent Salafism now at work in the Muslim world for all the reasons that I mentioned earlier. And therefore, what is also happening is a massive failure of the integration processes which we were so proud of. Uh, in fact, the, what we have seen in recent week, including after the murders, when we noticed that in hundreds of classes in France, children or youngsters would not observe a minute of silence for the dead because they felt insulted by the blasphemy and therefore condoned what had happened. We find the limit here of the so-called uh, integration model. So what is happening as a result of these two fronts is that we are living through something that is going to threaten the very fabric of the nation in France, but probably also in Belgium or in Denmark or elsewhere. And this is exactly, of course, the goal of the Islamic State leaders. They want to create the so-called clash of civilization. They want civil war in Europe between the Muslim segment and the rest of society. And therefore, one of the central issue in front of us is to address this very firmly with our wide, uh, eyes wide open and at the same time with a great deal of tolerance, respect for the rule of law, and of course without falling into the trap of populism and racism. Having said all this, having defined the problem that we are now faced with, the issue is how do we deal with it? And here the agenda is simply huge. Um, I would say first step is to make sure that all Europeans understand that this is a common threat. And believe me, it's not easy. Many of our European neighbors in France do not even perceive the threat, especially in Northern Europe. Libya, Boko Haram is very, very far away. And if we look at uh, our operation in, Central, in Africa, France is very lonely, very lonely. It would be nice to have more European airplanes, more European soldiers to help us in a very expensive and complicated uh, um, situation. It would be nice to see military budget in Europe going uh, slightly up. Everybody, most everybody is below 1% of the GDP. It would be nice also to start acting on immigration in a serious fashion. We have something in Europe called Schengen. Schengen de facto doesn't work. Or even some people would say Schengen is dead. Because you already have in the system, as you know, Schengen works on the notion that the border country in which the immigrant come in is responsible for that immigrant. And therefore, he has a key to your house and he's responsible. De facto, we know that the Schengen system work uh, with the, f the following division, there is the transit countries. Greece is one, for example. In Greece, you have each year at least 150,000 illegal migrants coming in through Turkey. Turkey, of course, is very keen in sending illegal migrants to Europe. It's also very keen in sending terrorists into Syria and Iraq. But we receive a lot of uh, immigrants through uh, uh, Greece. But we receive them also uh, from Spain and Italy 
and they go in the countries which are more generous, and one of the most generous, if not the most generous in, in Europe, is France. So yes, uh, moving into a, a renegotiation of Schengen, trying to fix the, the holes, uh, harmonize the situation between the, the various social system, welfare system, is urgent. Second, uh, we have to do away with family regrouping. Not easy, because now it's part of uh, European law. Third, we have to do away with uh, welfare not connected to work. Of the 200,000 legal migrants that I mentioned earlier, only 7% will go to work in France. Everybody else is on welfare. That's the reality. I told you I was not going to be very politically correct. Fourth, on asylum rights, we now have uh, uh, transferred into French law a recent European directive, which makes it simply impossible. It is so protective of the asylum seeker that this person can multiply recourses in front of various tribunals and, in fact, make sure never to be expelled, even if the uh, demand is not uh, founded. So the result is the explosion of the number of uh, asylum seekers. Germany, for example, has 200,000 people claiming for asylum last year alone. On the security side, at least seven measures come to mind. Adopt urgently the PNR, the personal name record. Second, make sure we have a proper terrorist counter-terrorist organization at the Brussels level. It's not the case. We have now, today, a simple coordinator. Third, what to do about Turkey? Candidate country to the Union. It is the main gate for illegal immigration on one side and uh, jihadist candidates on the other. This is where they go through. Fourth, legislation. I wish I had time to go into the jurisprudence the decision of the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, which applies the 1949 Convention. I have found some decisions which are just plain ridiculous, given the, the, the issues we are faced with. In a recent decision, dated October or November of 2014, France was condemned to pay 52,000 euros penalties to Somali pirates who had attacked French boats, all right, which wrongly we captured, our commandos captured them. But the, the court found that they were presented to the judge perhaps a little too late. In other decisions, uh, Mohamed Begal, who was the emir of the Kouachi brothers and of, and of Koulibaly, this guy, was living for several years nicely in a hotel in central France because the Strasbourg court prevented his expulsion to his home country, Algeria, after we stripped him of nationality. In another scandalous case in UK called Abu Qatada, a Jordanian national, not even British, Jordanian national, was prevented from expulsion back to Jordan even after the UK and Jordan had signed a special convention promising not to use death penalty and decent judgment on the guy who had been convicted on, on inspiring two terrorist attacks in Jordan. There are two or three other cases like this which are simply not acceptable. So I'm working now on a resolution uh, which we'll put in French Parliament trying to tell our, our, our French, uh, you know, fr European friends and the French government, please look at this convention again. Let's try to rewrite the, 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 kind of, the, the way the court. Fifth, go after um, internet operators. And go after big, because as long as we keep the propaganda machine open, then we will have continued problems. And we need to do a collective international effort to block a diffusion of, of these images or call for jihad. Uh, six, we have to go after money and uh, volunteers, jihadists. The idea is simple. We need to go and to take the, the, 
the accomplices to the International court, uh, Criminal Court and make sure that those countries who fund directly or indirectly the, the Islamic states or subsidiaries of it or let volunteers go into Syria or Iraq are put in front of the International Criminal Court. Finally, we have to work on penal policy. Uh, what do we do with uh, people coming back from jihad? How do we judge their de-radicalization? What are the criteria? What do we do after they, they serve sentence? These are huge uh, issues. Last, uh, on fighting the caliphate. Um, and again, this, this could take uh, a whole discussion in itself. But uh, again, I'm calling on our European friends to please share the burden. Military intervention by France this year will cost 1.3 billion euros. Be nice to see uh, this burden shared by others. Um, and look hard at military action. I'm not so sure that continuing with interventions is necessarily helping in certain cases. So there is a fine line to tread, but I have no time to, to dwell in it. Uh, we have seen in recent years that interventions tend to make things even worse in the long term, and we end up looking as, as occupiers. Finally, let me very briefly make three message on the integration model. First of all, contrary to what I've read in the press, France is not an apartheid country. We have done probably many mistakes, uh, but the French Republic is certainly the most generous, one of the most generous places in the world. Um, France houses newcomers, it educates newcomers without asking for their papers. It cures people without asking for their papers. In fact, it's cheaper for a foreigner to, to come and be cured in France than there for a French people who has to pay, at least for some of his hospital bills. For a foreigner, it's absolutely free, whether you have papers or not papers. So when I hear the word apartheid, I think it's largely exaggerated, and I think one of the things we need to do in France and in Europe is get away from the excuse theory. Again, if you look at the Herald Tribune this morning, you will see that the guy who perpetrated this horror in Denmark was a victim of Danish ghettos. France has integrated hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of migrants throughout the years. Not everybody starts terrorism or burn cars or refuse to hear about the Holocaust. Second, and I'm, I'm, I'm finishing, a message about laïcité, because I know it is not always known in our uh, uh, partner countries. The last man who was killed in France for blasphemy was Chevalier de la Barre, a young man in 1766. He had a uh, damaged a little bit a crucifix in a town called Abville. He was condemned to torture and condemned to death. When the revolution came, he was rehabilitated, and in 1905 we took this law called the law of separation of state and from religion. This is part of French history, very profoundly. The republic protects the religion, but the religion is a private affair. And yes, in France you can do blasphemy against the Jewish religion, the Catholic religion, the Islamic religion. That's the way it is, and you can go to court, but blasphemy is not a crime. What is a crime is to call for racist violence. And that difference needs to be understood. Lastly, about anti-Semitism. You have in front of you a legislator who actually wrote a law, now became a law in 2003, actually doubling the penalty for hate crimes against people of different creed or different color. So I know about anti-Semitism in my country. I know about the, the, the call for death to the Jews which happened in the streets of Paris. I know about Mohamed Merah and what he did, shooting the head of a four-year-old little girl in front of a Jewish school. I know all this. But at the same time, I simply cannot accept that a foreign 
leader would call on the French Jews to leave their country to come here. Uh, as the Israeli president said, if Jews in Europe want to do the Aliyah, please do it for the right reason. Europe is not living under Hitler. This is a fight for democracies and values. And French Jews, Danish Jews, German Jews have their part in this fight. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what I wanted to tell you today. Thank you for your attention.